Welcome to the 24th Return to Freud. Uh, in this um, workshop, we're going to be covering one paper from 1915 uh, titled Thoughts for the Times on War and Death. Uh, this is a quite unique paper, I think, at this point in Freud's career. It is a specific response to World War I. Um, you can definitely notice a turn in Freud's attention as it relates to psychoanalysis and applying psychoanalytic knowledge to practical worldly affairs and social affairs, commentary on human nature, um, commentary on, on the species, um, and, and trying to explore insofar uh, what psychoanalysis has to say about, or what psychoanalysis can contribute to our understanding of war and to our understanding of violence and to our understanding of our society. I would say the biggest shift here, which is, which is of crucial historical importance, is that this is the moment really, and it becomes evident as we get into Freud's writings in between 1915 and 1920, which are in some sense anticipating the book Beyond the Pleasure Principle, that Freud becomes I don't want to say obsessed, but Freud becomes increasingly aware of death and increasingly aware of the place or the role of death in human cognition, human, human mind. And um, that can, you might be able to say, is different than the first few decades of psychoanalysis where Freud is mostly focused on, say, sexuality. So I'm going to share my screen now. All right, thoughts for the times on war and death. This is part one of the paper and there are two, two parts. All right, so Freud starts by saying that the war has been a enormous intrusion, let's say, it has created an enormous confusion among the people. There's been a loss of orientation, um, specifically confusion related to values and judgments. Uh, you might say that it's here, something that has disrupted normal and common life, of course. And there's this feeling present in 1915 that no event has ever destroyed so much that is precious for common humanity. Although he also reflects on the fact that certainly there have been wars in the past and certainly there have been wars throughout all of, all of human history, which may have brought humans this type of feeling that everything's been destroyed. What's interesting is he says, even the clearest intelligences are now confused and that the highest of civilizational values have become debased. And I think that this is, this is worth reflecting on that, that no matter how intelligent you are, no matter how civilized you think you might be, um, you might say that there can be an intrusion of the real. There might be uh, something totally unanticipated, something unpredictable. Um, that occurs and destroys everything and changes everything we think about ourselves and our, and our society. Certainly World War I uh, was such an event. He refers to science herself as losing its passionless impartiality. I don't think anybody today, or at least I don't think many people today, especially in the social sciences, view science as an impartial, a uh, passionless endeavor. I think <clears throat> most of us are aware of how science is used for political reasons, um, used uh, in power games, let's say. Certainly it's something that's been highlighted with thinkers like Foucault and Derrida, many, and I guess Bruno Latour as well. In any case, there was a massive disillusionment that has altered the attitude towards death. I suppose there was this feeling in 1914 or this feeling in 1913 that civilization had overcome 
or at least had put death in, in, in the distance, that it wasn't something that needed to be confronted directly. It actually reminds me of many conversations that are being had today in many intellectual circles about technology being used to overcome death. Um, there's this feeling that anything is possible, that we can live forever or that we can extend our lifespans and that we can eventually conquer death even. And there's an enormous disillusionment that occurs. Uh, specifically, the disillusionment in 1913 was, of course, in retrospect, this might sound ridiculous, but there was an expectation that the great world dominating nations of the white race would lead humanity to a, a peaceful wor world without war. Now that, that is, of course, a ridiculous expectation. And it's, of, of course, um, an inflated uh, sense of, of, of European civilization. Um, but the point here is that we today as a human species have perhaps ridiculous expectations that could become shattered at any, any moment. And that this, even though the historicity of these expectations are ridiculous, uh, nonetheless, the disillusionment was probably felt um, extremely strong. The basic situation uh, before the war, according to Freud, was, and this is perhaps uh, the common stereotype of civilization before World War I, or at least European civilization before World War I, is that there were incredibly high norms of morality and that conformity demanded um, just a high level of moral conduct in order to participate in civilized life. Basically here, Freud's saying is that society is repressed and that the cultural expectations demanded too much self-restraint, <coughs> specifically too much renunciation of instinct. Here, Freud is definitely starting to apply some of the understandings of psychoanalysis, which also obviously focus on the mind's relationship to instinct, something that's often repressed and something that's often not discussed properly in, in biology or psychology, really. He does say that there were warning voices that old traditional differences would make war inevitable, but people refuse to listen. Of course, today, it's hard to imagine a war breaking out in the same way as something like World War I or World War II. But I think we should be aware of the way in which something like World War I or World War II were really older styles of combat between, especially World War I, <clears throat> really 19th century styles of combat, which were being enacted with 20th century technology. And it, it might not be so far-fetched to think that <clears throat> a 21st century style war um, could occur uh, just with radically different technologies uh, in a different sort of a qualitatively different style of war. Uh, and certainly many people would make the argument that perhaps things like that are already happening, financial wars, trade wars, and so forth. He said, the war is more destructive than any other day, and that's because of the increased perfection of weapons. The most important thing I think about World War I is that, they, again, there was 19th century style combat with much improved industrial technology, and it led to really brutal, brutal um, conditions, of course. Of course, everyone knows about, we all learn about the trench warfare. He said, it's <clears throat> at least as cruel as any other war. It disregards international law, disregards the wounded and the civil military divide. <clears throat> what really Freud's getting at here is that even though we, European civilization at the time had had these high moral expectations and standards, um, there are still these very brutal, very primeval impulses 
that can emerge at any moment and can can and we're and we're released and we're we're on display in world war one says the dissolution of civil life allowed for the emergence of evil passions cruelty fraud treachery and barbarity <clears throat> one might say in specifically in the way freud's talking about this that with the suspension of the big other and with the 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 sort of repressed nature of the civilized of, of civilized behavior um the sort of the truth of the society was able to come out the truth of the society was able to sort of be put on display in in world war one it's like the big other is not looking anymore now we can release all of our evil passions cruelty fraud treachery and so forth <clears throat> Freud highlights that there were two main aspects to disillusionment. The first is a low morality shown externally by states which internally guard moral standards. In other words, internally a nation like Germany or a nation like France might have displayed this idea of extremely high moral standards, but as soon as <clears throat> the opportunity presented itself, the, the external relations between the states became just as barbaric as, as any behavior. There was also a brutality shown by individuals who, quote unquote, participate in the highest civilization. In other words, people who were well-educated, people who were um, training to be professionals in, in many different disciplines that we associate with high civilization. Um, and nonetheless, they were still able to behave with the, the, the crudest brutality. So he then starts to talk about psychoanalysis. And he critiques two views. You might say these are two pre-psychoanalytic views of how we rise uh, in a moral sense. The first, uh, both of these views, of course, he says as naive. The first of those views is that we are virtuous and noble from birth. The second of these views is that we become moral in a developmental process from evil to good. He says we contradict psychoanalysis, specifically contradicts both of these views. Uh, of course, we are, our minds are being conditioned by instinctual impulses, which are fundamentally narcissistic. And also <clears throat> he claims that the developmental process is not so teleological in the sense that there's no such thing as eradicating evil. So you don't go from a developmental process from evil to good in that simplistic way. He claims psychoanalysis has discovered that the deepest aspect of human nature can be found in the ineradicable instincts and the primal needs. We just have to think about what it would be like to be an infant. The quality of experience of being an infant, our primordial impotence, our primordial dependence on the other, and the needs that need to be met in this state. According to Freud, psychoanalysis has discovered that these needs never disappear. The primal needs, he says, are neither good nor bad. I think in this paper, he's clearly pointing towards a Nietzschean view of morality, uh, that of beyond good and evil. It says primal needs are neither good or bad, that society simply condemns selfish and primitive impulses as evil, and that's why we see them as evil. It's really just a tension, you might say, between the id and the superego. The primitive impulses undergo inhibition through develop development, and this is where repression becomes a problem. That because our most primitive impulses, our most desired impulses are inhibited, we never really understand ourselves and we never really understand our motive. And we always, as it were, try to get what we want in roundabout ways. 
Now he talks about a really interesting phenomenon that the primitive impulses make their appearance in a pairs of opposites. And I think here Freud is demonstrating <laughs> his capacity for dialectical thinking. He claims that it's remarkable that primitive impulses make their appearance in this way, basically in the polarity of love and hate. One can think about this, that you love the object that allows you to exist, that brings you nourishment, satisfaction. And you also hate that you're dependent on this other or this object. He says, the intense love and hate are found together, often found in the same person for their object. I think probably all of us here, at least I can speak for myself, have experienced the phenomenon of loving and hating the same person, of being infatuated with the same person at the same time, hating the fact <laughs> that I'm dependent or somehow out of control in my feelings. He calls this the ambivalence of feeling that specifically that we experience contradictory or mixed feelings about the same object or person. And I can definitely, again, speak on a personal level that perhaps everyone that I've, I've loved, I've experienced this weird sensation of fundamentally contradictory and mixed, mixed emotions about the same person, um, at least in myself. They, they, they do appear in, in, in a way of feeling this dependence on the other and not necessarily, not necessarily being content with the fact that I'm basically not getting enjoyment in, a, in an auto-erotic, um, self-sufficient form. He says, instinctual vicissitudes must be surmounted before the person's character can form in a way that we might say good or bad. In other words, as he said, the primal impulses are not good and bad. And so if the individual has not surmounted these instinctual vicissitudes, in other words, simply acts them out unconsciously or represses them, that they're not really good or bad. They're just struggling with their primal needs, you might say. And in any case, he says human beings are never altogether good or bad, but good or bad in relational context. <clears throat> of course, this is very popular today. Um, the, perhaps the easiest way to say it is that good and bad or good and evil are not absolute terms. Um, when we say, for example, in simplistic ways, Hitler was evil and Gandhi was good. Uh, these are absolute statements which are in many ways reifications of individuals which are much too simplistic and that we have to understand good and bad in relation and in context. Um, he then says that most selfish, and this is very interesting, says most selfish or bad children, quote unquote, and by bad, he simply means children who are basically acting out narcissistic impulses have unmistakable inclination to good as adults. Um, this might here lead to the teleological view, of course. He's not saying that evil or bad or selfish or narcissistic impulses are eradicated, merely that if a subject is in touch with their most primal needs, um, works through them, that one comes to a deeper understanding of self and perhaps a more other-centric point of view as a, as a result. Um, this definitely resonates with me uh, when I think about perhaps how I have behaved in sexual relationships that in acting out, quote unquote, selfish or bad behavior, um, one comes to see um, the benefits and the, the logic of, of, of the good, let's say. The transformation of bad to good by two factors, he claims, 
one external factor, one internal factor, which both work in the same direction. The internal factor is simply that the um, influence of so-called egotistical or narcissistic impulses of the instincts um, become transformed towards um, the need for love, the need for the other. And this is this is an internal logic, which I think is 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 under appreciated, um, understated. And, and oftentimes the external factor, namely the force of cultural environment as a direct presser of renunciation is probably given too much attention, uh, not enough attention played on the, the internal factor at work here as well. Um, I think of course, both are at work as Freud's saying, simply that I, I, in my experience, humans underestimate and understate the internal factor here that simply through acting out your sexual impulses in an egotistical way uh, by themselves lead you to a higher need for human love. I, in, in my experience, that's, that's true. In any case, the individual's life um, is structured, according to Freud, in an in a overall trend towards pro-social behavior from e original egoic behavior. Again, all of us from an infantile condition start off with an egoic, um, narcissistic view of the world. And through maturation, we come to have a deeper understanding of our, our need for social others and, and, and also the desire the authentic desire to embed ourselves pro-socially. That this pressure has been accumulating throughout the whole of civilization. And I think that this, this topic is, is also something that's not perhaps discussed as much as it should. And perhaps uh, for probably for sensitive reasons due to Eurocentric points of view and colonial um, colonial history, but that we're not only affected by our immediate culture and the civilization as it is now, but also the history of our civilization that stretches back for thousands of years, um, perhaps even hundreds of thousands of years. The problem, however, with civilization is that in itself, it is not concerned with good motivation, only good outcome. And I think, I don't know to what extent this is also true today, but I, I think it is true today that we want the appearance of the good, but we don't really want to understand what it means to be truly good, let's say. In other words, someone can give the appearance of, of being a good person, but as soon as, again, back to the example, he's talking about this because of the situation in World War I, of course, in order to be really good, you have to be good, not just because the big other is looking, but because that's your authentic intrinsic motivation. <clears throat> as soon as no one's looking, you start acting like an asshole, for lack of a better word. He says, civilization's lack of concern for true motive leads to an excessive repression of instinct. In other words, civilization isn't so concerned with the very process by which someone stays in touch with their instinct, stays in touch with what they really are, and cultivates it, or I would say sublimates it, um, in, a, in a way that points towards pro-social behavior. And, and perhaps that's because civilization has trouble thinking dialectically. <clears throat> perhaps it's because there's a great amount of risk and danger in uh, people being in touch with their quote unquote true, true motives, their, their, their deepest instincts. It's scary, it could evoke a lot of fear. But that the neurotic disorders, which make psychoanalysis necessary, are a result of such excessive repression on sexual instinct. And, and he goes, I'm in, in many other papers that follow this paper. 
he goes on to emphasize that really what psychoanalysis is, is, is about this battle between the sexual instincts, <clears throat> pardon me, and the ego. That I think this is incredibly interesting. He says individuals acting out moral precepts, precepts against instinctual expression are cultural hypocrites. And in the next slide, he'll say, there are more cultural hypocrites than civilized men. And I think that that distinction is really important. I think that if someone's acting, you know, the, the best example, I'm just going to go to the next slide because I think there's, yeah, there's a picture of, of priests there. But I, I, I really do think that, that the best example here are, you know, you have Catholic priests who are acting out horrific behaviors, sexual behaviors, and they give the appearance of civilized men, but of course they are more akin to cultural hypocrites. And he says that the best thing for the future of society would be that we actually transform our instinct for a better society. And I think that that's really, at least for me, the key. And this is really one of the most important points that I take away from all of these readings of Freud is that we, we, can't, be, we can't be scared or timid in working with instinct. And we can't assume that people will just become civilized through a, for lack of a better word, a disembodied education. Uh, we have to have an embodied education. Um, and that will involve working with ourselves and working with each other in ways that our current education system certainly does not do. <clears throat> and as a consequence of us being cultural hypocrites, or at least in the 1915 context, he says, the disillusionment is unjustified. In other words, we should have expected our images to be crushed under the weight of brutal aggression. That our fellow citizens had not sunk so low because they had never risen so high. They had the appearance of being high and then the, the truth of being low. The primitive stages of mental development, he says, can always be reestablished and they are imperishable. And that's one of the most difficult things about doing body work, I think. And that's one of the most difficult things I've learned in working with either my sexuality directly and things like no fap or, 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 <clears throat> or working with my oral drive with things like fasting is that the, the, the quote unquote uh, instinctual drives, they're imperishable. They never go away. They're never going to go away. They're going to be with me and I have to work with them. And there's an internal pressure to these drives um, that is, is ineradicable, imperishable. So he says, when it comes to the primal unconscious, we throw off our hard-won morality every night and that our dreams reveal the truth of ourselves. And that in dream analysis, of course, dream interpretation, where psychoanalysis really gets its fundamental anchoring, that this truth is, is, is evident, self-evident. And that the only reason this is not dangerous is because when we're sleeping, we're basically paralyzed. Of course, unless you have some sort of episode like a night terror, in which case very dangerous things can happen. And that the primal unconscious may also be revealed with the impacts of war, again, the impacts of a, an unexpected event in life where all of a sudden the rules are changed. All of a sudden, everything's different. What's coming to mind for me at the moment is um, that movie, uh, Bird Box, although it's a you know, fantastical movie, I'm not saying anything like that will happen or could happen, but it's an example of something happens which changes everything and you see a brutal aggression beneath the surface. <clears throat> Another important example, I think, and this is something I've definitely learned at my time in academia, is that intellects are often unmoved by rational arguments and that the sort of belief that we are moved by rational argumentation is a, a false one and a dangerous one in my view. 
that affect Trump's intellect, and he says psychoanalysis, if anything, further solidifies this view. I think this is important to reflect on very deeply, uh, especially for intellectuals who often present arguments to each other in a disembodied way, um, that if we are to <clears throat> intellectually move each other, we should be aware of the embodied dimension and we should be aware of the effect, affect dimension. <clears throat> I was reflecting on this last week actually with a, a close friend and we were sort of reflecting on the fact that because we have such a strong emotional bond that we were more open to each other's intellectual arguments. Um, and that is often uh, not a part of traditional academia. In any case, nations, he says, are rationalizing their interests in order to really satisfy their passions. I think that this was also on display when I was studying the response of the United States government to 9-11. They were coming up with reasons for going to Afghanistan and Iraq which were merely satisfying quite vicious and ridiculous um, passions, egoic passions. And uh, so this, this still happens today. And this is still not just happening within us as individuals, but also happening on larger social levels. It says that nations could be recapitulating primitive courses of individual development. <clears throat> and that later stages of development plus more truth and honesty could improve relations between men. What is consistent throughout Freud's work, and it might be simplistic, but nonetheless, it's quite evident in his work is this emphasis on the truth, this emphasis on honesty in perhaps distinction to illusion, um, and appearance, but I think that there are some philosophical, of course, uh, we have a lot of Lacanians here, and I think that there are some philosophical paradoxes in the truth, but nonetheless, I think important to reflect on. Part two, this is a little bit shorter, uh, where Freud is going to be talking about death itself, and this now becomes, like I said at the beginning, Freud starts to reflect a lot more on what psychoanalysis can tell us about our relationship to death, which is a major um, shift of attention, let's say, in the analytic movement. It says, of course, we all understand death to be natural, undeniable, and unavoidable, but we behave otherwise, that we have a tendency to eliminate death from life. <coughs> He says, there is a German phrase that reminds us of death, which basically translates into, to think of something as though it were death, our own death. Uh, it's a funny that he mentions this phrase because I've actually used something like this phrase um, to motivate myself um, and to overcome irrational fears or to do something dangerous or to do something new. I think it's worth keeping the idea of death um, very close to the chest. In the psychoanalytic view, no one believes in his own death, that the unconscious is convinced of immortality. In other words, you can think about the infant, you can think about the earliest stages of development, that the unconscious mind doesn't know about death. Um, we are often shocked. Children are often shocked when they first learn about death. But nonetheless, children are not scared to talk about death. And it's rather that adults avoid conversations about death. You could say it's adults who are very disconnected from their unconscious. They must be extremely disconnected in order to avoid conversations about death. I actually had a conversation that I think it's worth mentioning here with a Freudian 
scholar who was doing her PhD on asking children about death and that the children in the classroom were very open to this experiment and wanted to talk about death, but it was rather the school system that was preventing her from completing her research. So again, what Freud's talking about here is still very much the truth. It says children will often say things like, dear mummy, when you're dead, I'll do this or that. In other words, they don't have any moral reproach or shield talking about death where we often feel certain level of self-reproach when it comes to talking about death, especially the death of a parent or the death of a loved one. It says for adults, thinking of another person's death is seen as wicked and hard-hearted. I've definitely had experiences with this emotion. Sensitivity does not prevent the occurrence of death. In other words, our sensitivity to death is irrational. Um, if we were purely rational, we could just talk about death as we talk about anything else. But we are always deeply affected and shaken by it. Towards the dead person, we adopt a special attitude, Freud says one of admiration for someone accomplishing a hard task. It's very strange, but at the same time, very true that we have this, this, this heightened sensitivity about death. And there's this unmistakable impression that Freud wants to give in this section that there's something we need to mature about here when it comes to our capacity to accept death. The reason being is that death has a powerful, at, a, this attitude towards death rather, this repressed attitude towards death has a powerful effect on our lives, leaving it impoverished with a loss of interest, no risk and empty. And that's the paradox of death. I think emphasized by a few interesting philosophers today, I think <clears throat> I'd like to shout out actually a classical philosophy YouTube channel, I think his name's, Yo I don't know how to pronounce his last name properly, but his first name's Johannes. And he's a Heideggerian philosopher. And he makes the, the, the point about this well as well, which is that when death is left out of the picture, paradoxically, life becomes empty. It's almost as though a fundamental emptiness has to be included in order for life to be full. I think that's an interesting paradox to wrestle with. Another case, uh, we get paralyzed by loss of the other and we refuse to undertake dangerous but indispensable risks. He mentions things like going traveling and trying new things. As I said, I myself have, have used the idea of death to precisely unparalyze myself because I do think that without this idea of death close to the heart, one dies before one dies. And he says basically this, that excluding death leads to renunciations and exclusions. And he gives the quote, uh, an ancient quote that says, it is necessary to sail the seas, but it is not necessary to live. Namely that it's necessary that we take risks and go on adventures but it's not necessary that we behave as though we are going to live forever. This is also very Nietzschean. When I, I recently read, reread Thus Spoke Zarathustra and Nietzsche definitely has this basic point of view. The result of fear of death is that we seek the world of fiction. Now this is incredibly interesting and incredibly interesting in the context of future technology Interesting to think about in the context of something like the metaverse or the that unreal engine, future gaming and future technology. That with literature and theater, Freud says, we compensate for lost life. In literature and theater, we find people who know how to die or even manage to kill someone. We, in other words, reconcile ourselves in fiction because we can have rematches if we die. We have a plurality of lives and we can die safely. And this is incredibly interesting, um, especially for myself, uh, reflecting on how much I enjoy playing something like Super Mario. 
you have many lives, for example. You can die and die again. <laughs> you can die and die better. And in fiction, that is quite unique and quite beautiful. In my experience, it's extremely liberating. Although Freud here, in the way he's talking about it, definitely gives a, a mixed point of view, almost as though we are not living. So we go into fiction as opposed to seeing fiction as this truthful reconciliation of our condition, which why not? Let's talk about it. Finally, he ends with reflections on the primeval and the unconscious relations to death. By primeval, he means, say, early human, early man. He says the early man has an attitude towards death that is contradictory where he takes it seriously. In other words, the early man sees death as finality and sees death as the end, but at the same time behaves and acts as though it doesn't exist. So that's the contradiction. It says primeval man had no objection to someone else's death, especially uh, someone, an enemy, um, and that they were often very passionate and cruel with the way that they would kill or view specifically the enemy. It says it is only with the awakening conscience that you have maxims or axioms like thou shalt not kill. He said savages, even he mentions populations in Australia, South America, and Africa as people who would atone for murders with tedious rituals. And he likens this to an awakening conscience of powerful prohibitions against killing and against the desire to kill. And I think that one of the most powerful aspects of this paper was the emphasis that you don't need to prohibit anything that is not desired deeply. The stronger, and I think this is a fantastic idea, that the stronger the prohibition, the stronger the desire. I think that's interesting to think about in the context of thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, thou shalt not, thou shalt not sleep with, you know, prohibitions in monogamy. It's interesting to think about in the context of prohibitions with um, drugs, um, prohibiting things like cocaine and heroin and hard drugs, psychedelics, prohibiting psychedelics. Um, he just makes the point that you don't need to prohibit something that, that the soul doesn't desire. said, the man of prehistoric times survives unchanged in our unconscious and behaves as if it were immortal. That's the crucial thing. And the unconscious knows nothing that is negative, knows no no, knows no negation. And contradictories collide. Of course, this reflects the dream state where the, the dream is always a pure wish fulfillment or affirmation. Knows no death said, for enemies, we do acknowledge death, and we consign them to it quite readily, unhesitatingly. I have to admit that I have that impulse, and I've had that feeling many times. Um, not something I obviously act on, but it's something that is definitely a part of my unconscious. The, uncon the unconscious impulse to get rid of anyone who stands in our way, offends us, or injures us is quite strong. And um, this is really, 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 really worth thinking about when it, when it comes to our friend networks, when it comes to building projects together, um, the way in which we can quickly turn on each other um, is something that needs to be made more conscious. The collision of attitudes to death as real or unreal is something here that he says gets worked through with the death of a loved one. Um, recently, my, my grandfather passed away, so I did have the experience of feeling very deeply the way in which the loved one is kind of like an inner possession. 
and that when the loved one dies, it's something that you really wrestle with as a part of your own ego dying. And he says that that the lay person, the non-psychoanalytically minded person is horrified at the possibility that they could actually wish death on a, on a loved one, that they could be excited about the opening of the possibility for the death of a loved one. This back to the child, the, the example he gave of the child uh, who would say, dear mommy, uh, when you die, I'll do this or that. Um, again, there's this problem of death and love is filled with um, quite vicious self-reproaches. Um, I could go deeper into my own experience with this in weird ways, but again, worth thinking about. I think this is the last slide. No, two, two slides left. It says basically the summary here is that the idea of death is inaccessible to the unconscious. It's something that we become conscious of. And the same goes for our more murderous inclination says wars strip us of our accretions of civilization and lay bare the primal man in each of us of course that could happen at any moment still today doesn't necessarily have to be war it could be a famine it could be some sort of tragic natural event that leads to obscene behavior i'm thinking here about the type of behavior that was observed around the time of hurricane katrina um, humans started behaving in very selfish ways, started forming gangs, and, and all sorts of things happened, uh, thinking of things like looting and rioting during protests or demonstrations. It says the unco unconscious stamp strangers as enemies, the death of the other is desired. Uh, this is back to the narcissistic impulse to be the center of the universe, to be the center of everything. And the other is in the way of that. And that he ends by saying death should be given its place in our reality. And that if you want to endure life, prepare for death. And I think that that's something that's coming through as a very powerful message in contemporary culture. And I think at least in my own intellectual journey and mission, I would say it's a, a central, increasingly taking a central position. So that's the paper. So thank you so much for your attention and time. And I will open it up. And just uh, unmute yourself uh, if you want to jump in otherwise i can continue to to talk about whatever <laughs> thanks for a great presentation by the way it's such a tremendously wild paper i love the paper yeah really deep reflection I think it's really like worth remarking here that it's only with the backdrop of this uh, great war that Freud really begins to give his sort of like view of civilization in, in the end. It's, a, it's marking a turning point where Freud is starting to venture into a broader uh, topic of what is really civilization in itself. But this happens only with the backdrop of this horrendous event that took place sort of abruptly. And what we see in the first half of the paper is him uh, really contrasting this larger scale event to the type of events that he sees as happening within every civilized person and what is uncovered in the analysis itself when he starts to listen to the neurotics. So this sort of like a abrupt, like opening of murderous impulses and everything. I think that the kind of like a 
contemporary psychologists who shies away from these topics and even the psychoanalytic views from last century that tried to somehow tame these wild speculations of Freud and everything. I, I think that we should totally discredit the whole, like trying to tame Freud into some kind of a clinician here. I mean, he's onto really something crucial here. And I would maybe like to read a quote that gives some, uh, an, an important view from, it's in the bigger file, I don't know which, Page. It's in a standard edition, but in the bigger fights, page 3079 at the end, uh, he says that psychoanalytic experience has, if possible, further confirmed the statement. Uh, it can show every day that the shrewdest people will all of a sudden behave without insight, like imbeciles, as soon as the necessary insight is confounded by an emotional resistance but that they will completely regain their understanding once that resistance has been overcome. The logical bedazzlement which this war has conjured up in our fellow citizens, many of them the best of their kind, is therefore a secondary phenomenon, a consequence of an emotional excitement and is bound up, we may hope, to disappear with it. Uh, I was even reminded of, of the first lines of uh, Allen Ginsberg's howl, seeing the best minds sort of like just collapse and everything. Yeah, it's it's extremely bizarre that, again, I think maybe the best word is this di disembodied cognition, but that there's this idea, you know, like a, a Stephen Hawking or an Albert Einstein or like the greatest geniuses that somehow they manage to overcome these inclinations or overcome these these dispositions, and I, I just think that it's 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 untenable to to really um, any proper understanding of the human condition to to have this view and think it's quite quite yeah I mean it's quite an illusion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if I may just shortly go ahead. Up, yeah. Uh, maybe we we could talk about this disembodied convention and everything, but I, I think it, it, maybe we should refine it in the way that Freud discusses the internal external sort of dialectic in this paper and everything. But that's a broader topic, and uh, I was interested in the fact that he stresses maybe he even says states love as a way out, as love as some kind of like way out of the whole like situation that we are concerned with so it's it would be even egoistic to uh to to love oneself so much that one cares about oneself and doesn't come under the sway of this type of like aggressive stupidity and everything eric did you want to jump in here or? yeah um <clears throat> When I was reading this, I, I thought this was the the most Zizekian that uh, Freud has gotten thus far in her readings. Uh, I kept I kept kind of expecting him to say, "Is it not precisely the opposite?" You know, <laughs> uh, he um, he he begins to to really go along. I think a, a lot of the lines that that Zizek gets to, uh, especially in what I've been reading in uh, the, the Fragile Absolute, <clears throat> and my, my thoughts are a little unformed here, I apologize, but what I, what I think he's describing <clears throat> is not so much a repression of these instinctual urges and, and, and such, but rather a kind of sublation, if we could use that term, where these instinctual urges are are sublated in, in two ways. One, uh, into uh, higher forms of violence or exploitation through capitalism, through the exploitation of capital. And what that does is through the mechanism of surplus value surplus enjoyment 
creates desire. And it is through desire that the, the superego, which he is beginning to develop in, in this paper, you can see the, the echoes of, the, of that, uh, it begins to direct those instinctual desires or instinctual drive, the, the drive energy towards um, those objects of desire. And so when that breaks down, when, when these mechanisms of uh, these sublated mechanisms of exploitation and, and, and violence break down at the top, then there's a reversion at the bottom towards these uh, more primal states. And I, I think we, we see the, this happening today. Um, you know, you remarked earlier that, you know, we don't really have wars fought in this way anymore. But if we look at what kind of global conflict we're in now with the pandemic, it's, it's a very similar uh, situation where we, we thought that we were this great civilized world and, and that we were, there was so much um, cooperation and, and, you know, the, In, the development flow. Yeah. The development of technology, <laughs> global capitalism and, and so on. And all of this breaks down and, and, and now we, we can't get people to wear masks or get vaccinated. Right. The, the mechanisms of desire have completely broken down. And these, these uh, primal instinctual urges are now uh, driving civilization rather than these sublated, um, uh, you know, having a sublating that into higher forms of, of, um, of, of control. And so, you know, <clears throat> Zizek talks about the, the spectral nature of, of capital. And, and so the, these um, instinctual urges are sublated into something that is at the level of the virtual, right? The, they don't go away. They're not repressed into the unconscious, but they're sublated into something that's, that's at the level of the virtual or that we don't really notice. And the result of that surplus enjoyment is the creation of the object ah, the the cause of desire that then directs those uh, instinctual urges towards various objects and that we call civilization so on uh, so that's that's kind of my uh, the way I was reading this paper kind of along with Zizek um, I hope that made any sense at all. <clears throat> Could you could you give? I would ask a question. Could you give maybe uh, uh, the distinction for those listening between repression and sublation, and what you mean by by sublation as as distinct in 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 this regard? Sure. So when we think of something repressed, we think of it in terms of of the individual uh, con uh, uh, conscience that that diverts this uh, undesirable psychical energy towards the unconscious, how Freud describes it in various places. Um, <clears throat> whereas sublation is a negation of it, of, of something that then carries that negation to a higher plane, higher conceptual plane. Uh, so, if we have these instinctual urges, rather than repressing it into the unconscious, kind of pretending it's not there and so on, we take those instinctual urges and we raise it to a, a higher conceptual level. In other words, our instinctual urges are, are not in uh, actual physical violence and, and murder and such, but in, uh, capitalist exploitation you know something at the level of that that's at a higher level this this virtual or spectral level that zizek talks about 
Mm -hmm. And the result of that is this creation of the the big other, the creation of the superego that through the mechanism of this surplus enjoyment that Lacan talks about uh, surplus value in Marx is what then, again, rather than repressing those urges, directs them towards these various objects of desire. Hmm. Hmm. Thinking about, if anyone else wants to jump in here, please do, but Ole, Ole, am I pronouncing your name correct? Correctly? Yeah, maybe I should wait. I have sort of another question. You can okay. do riff on this. I just, okay, we'll, we'll get to you next then. And I just wanted to sort of add to, or not add, but just sort of maybe just reflect on this distinction between sublation and repression because one of the context I'm thinking about it in, in, the, in terms of the example that um, Eric's giving here of raising instinctual urges to a higher conceptual level from say physical violence to capitalist exploitation is that you often see like people who are like working on Wall Street or financial traders and, and stuff like that who are engaged in a type of sublation, but the sort of the price they pay for it is, for example, they might have like a, a secret cocaine addiction or something like that, where like there's a there's a there's a deep urge that that still needs to be be met on a on a on a visceral bodily level because it's almost like they're sacrificing themselves to the superego of capital. And in that regard, like I, I'm wondering if if maybe this is directly a question for Eric is in most of my commentaries on Freud, I see the mechanism of sublimation as something that could potentially, you know, there's actually a direct quote that Freud had in a paper I think we covered recently where he says that in sublimation, you can achieve satisfaction without repression. Because it seems to me like in in sublation, there's still the, the danger of regression, let's say. You know, because because basically the capitalist exploitation is still violent. You know, fundamentally, it's just it's not physically killing people, but it's you know the 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 impulse is still incredibly violent. Yeah, I think that's the the difference between what I mean by sublation and <clears throat> sublimation. They're very similar ideas, but the violence doesn't go away. It yes. doesn't get transformed in any way. It just gets booted up to a higher level yeah and and the result is the because it's up at a higher level what happens is there's a creation of this super egoic uh mechanism of control that diverts the energy of the drive yeah totally uh, also intervene in this, this yeah Shizeki and discuss this yeah uh, i may improvise a few lines since uh when every pointed out that Freud is really the most Zizekian here, it's, it's funny to think about, but yeah, it rings so true since um, I think that the initial thesis that uh, Zizek begins his philosophical works in his uh, sublime object of ideology is that there is this type of like antagonism inherent to all culture. And when Zizek reads uh, Freud's own behagen in the culture. Uh, it doesn't mean that there is a, some sort of like normality from which some neurotics, some psychopathologists are just exclu- excluded and they didn't make it and so on. But there is this like discontentment in, in being in a culture as such. And uh, it also relates to his like criticism of Hegel of sexuality in Hegel. It's it's not that we somehow like when, when primitive peoples uh, approached their love object, they were like brutal and in the sublimated, sublimated culture, so to say, we, we should instead write some beautiful poetry and so on. It's just a naive picture which we must think over with Freudian terms. But just to return to what Rizek in his sublime object of ideology starts in the introduction to say that there is the death drive itself, which Freud begins to develop, we could also maybe see here, since Freud goes very deep into death towards the end here, 
which he obviously continues in his paper on like beyond the pleasure principle. Uh, well, Zizek is saying that death drive is not a biological fact, but a notion indicating that the human psychic apparatus is subordinated to a blind automatism of repetition beyond pleasure seeking, beyond uh, self preservation in accordance between man and his milieu. And death drive is a dimension of radical negativity that cannot be reduced to an expression of alienated social conditions. So when he's talking about overcoming capitalism or everything, we must not be naive idiots who think that he's seeking for some kind of culture where, where capitalism is somehow evaporated and we can live in harmony with the big other or something like that. It does, he's not a stupid like old school Marxist. And for Zizek, all culture is just a way of cultivating this fundamental imbalance, this traumatic kernel to att an attempt to limit it to, and so on. And well, another like option for this type of view is for him brought about by uh, totalitarianisms. All totalitarianisms have always perpetuated, perpetuated this idea of a harmonious being of the new man of being able to somehow uh, we could think like slip into the big other, become one with the totality of everything. That's totalitarianism. That, so that's the fundamental, like I, I see the, the like intellectual tension in, in, in Zizek. That was brilliant, Mika. Brilliant. Ole? Okay, yes, uh, thank you for the presentation. It was wonderful. Um, but I have a question that might reflect this, but I'm sort of my thoughts are sort of unfinished, but it regards like, he mentions that the unconscious does not is like does not know mortality, right? He, he did mention that, and that's true. Yeah. Of, yeah, it sort of makes me think that like you've been conversing with Alexander Bard, and he's mentioning like mortido and libido, and also like Freud seems to be saying that you know like in late Freud, I think like he sort of mentions like men are born with these evil instinctual drives, right? And then society has to put the pressure on them, and then they develop neurosis but like i was reading like alan watts sort of other buddhist text that say that you know in buddhism you presupposes that buddha nature is the original nature and whereas in christianity as Freud also mentions says that like original sin is the core drive um but then so yeah but then you when it comes to the idea that buddha nature is the original nature you can't forget that the buddha became buddha through a through a narrative process where he had to confront death mm -hmm. like but buddha buddha didn't like we don't start out as as buddhas the potential to become buddha might be in all of us okay well yeah. that's how i that's how i understand it yeah because i was reading alan watson he, put, he puts this like sort of double bind he calls it and like how we have to develop the ego and then it's like the ego that is sort of in some sense destructive but i was also thinking about like what you if you had any thoughts on like mortido and libido like bar seems to say that like okay the, the ego wants to live and the mortido just wants to die and just return uh but maybe that's not relevant here because ford hadn't developed the death drive yet or, the death or... the death drive the death drive is an incredibly important notion and it's it is like i think where we are in this return to freud is that we we've covered Freud's writings from 1890 now to 1915, and most of the writings, if not all of the writings so far, are mostly about libido theory. And now I think we're at a really crucial junction in, in the return to Freud because because of World War I, as, as Mika pointed out, because of the backdrop of this social um, catastrophe, Freud starts to bring death more into the into the scene and and i think that the papers we'll be covering in between 1915 and 1920 are kind of almost like a, a pre a precursor to the idea of the death drive um that get that then gets sort of fully developed with the beyond the pleasure principle and then there's the rift internal to psychoanalysis about sort of the, the role of this i think what mika said really well just a moment ago of um, if I can really quote him directly, uh, when he was talking about the death drive as a dimension of radical negativity beyond alienation, this, 
beyond pleasure seeking and self preservation. Um, the, the, this this dimension is is kind of the opposite of what we think of as the libido. The libido as pleasure principle, the uh, the libido as self preserving, the libido as sort of some positive attachment to objects. Maybe even self love. Thank you. <laughs> that was done that was a good thank you yeah alexandra i, I just want to say before i get to alexandra just about the story of the the idea of the original buddha nature i think it's, it's crucial to me that when we think about and i think this is often left out of more eastern mystical metaphysics is that when we think about the buddha we can't forget the story the narrative process you know, it's like, it's like you just can't just jump to Buddha. Yeah, but I think this is, well, this is, that's anyway, my, my point. Uh, Alexandra, did you want to jump in? Yes, thank you. Um, I would like to, to try to answer, do you hear me? I would like to try to answer to your question. You asked um, uh, about... Uh, a rest that is not capable to be sublimated, if I understood well. I don't know if I heard you properly there. I asked about what? You asked something uh, about the difference between uh, sublimation and... Uh, sublation. Uh, not, I, I will talk about sublimation. Go for it. Okay. So, so um, as I understand... Um, in Lacan, he explains this very well, that um, in the sexual relation, even if it's consumed and uh, there is a jouissance, a sexual jouissance, there is a rest. There is always a rest that returns, an unconscious uh, rest. And then Lacan in... Uh, the late Lacan uh, starts and uh, develops this very interesting concept of um, um, su supplementary jouissance, jouissance supplementaire. Uh, this is a jouissance um, of mystics, a jouissance, uh, a feminine jouissance which he considers is a jouissance without rest. So in a way, uh, this is uh, the, <laughs> the sublimation without rest. And he's talking about um, uh, the woman and the mystics. Um, while the phallic jouissance is always a jouissance with a rest that uh, is refulated in the, the unconscious and returns and comes back. So uh, that would be an example. I don't know exactly what's the different, what's uh, that word that seems so much to be sublimation, sublation or what? Sublation is a Hegelian concept, but we don't need to, to dwell too much on it because we're, I think we're in interesting territory with, with the point you're, you're bringing up here. Yes, um, so it's supplementary jouissance. Yeah. yeah, well, I, I just have a, a joke for you here because uh, it says you said there's a sublimation without rest and there's a, a funny meme a woman shared a, a few weeks ago I, I forget who it was but she shared a meme that said <clears throat> uh, when your when your vibrator stops working when it runs out of uh, when it runs out of energy she says it's like having sex with a man <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Okay, there is also. Some, some, one... some, we we need to have a rest, Alexander. We need to uh -huh. have a rest. It's not our it's not our fault. Yes, but you know, rest, <laughs> rest, uh, this rest uh, is ambiguous. Rest can be a rest, something I'm just that was not consumed, and rest without rest can can be also without stopping. Yeah, so it's it's it has a double meaning. This rest without rest. Yeah. And on the other, very uh, interesting. And on the other sense, the other sense, uh, the other thing. What I want to say, 
is that uh, if we think about Lacan and his relation to all kinds of death, we should remember that he's talking about this uh, zone, this interval between the first death and the second death. And this uh, territory is a tragic one, a tragic zone. So he is developing in a very interesting uh, way uh, this concept of death, not only the death drive as um, maybe even a stronger drive than uh, the sexual drive, the pleasure one. The pleasure, um, and he is talking also about uh, the death of the analyst, the death of um, the subject, the death of the uh, symbol. So there are many deaths. Uh, and now uh, I would like to ask all of you, uh, who is dying? We are talking about death, but who is dying? The ego, the subject, um, the symbol. <laughs> uh, the imaginary but, yeah it's interesting it's i mean i yeah. think this this is this is a, it's a, it's worth reflecting on on this i at least where freud is where where we're reading him now he's he's bringing up more and more the distinction between the germ plasm of of life the the life itself kind of as a quasi immortal substance yes and, because because uh, sorry just something to say i had an insight we talk uh, about death as being opposed to birth but both are um, are uh, forms of life so life um, that's what you try to say i think that life uh, can express itself through death and birth and these are just limits they they yeah. It's a limit, it's a, it's a, how to say, a frontier in which they touch one the other. And uh, exactly as Ole asked, this is very interesting what he asked, that uh, in unconscious there is no death. So um, I ask again, who is dying? Because it's a transcendence. We, we have this expression in our religion, in the Orthodox religion, uh, I don't know exactly how to translate it. It's uh, used uh, in Eastern with the re resurrection of uh, Jesus Christ. We say like that, um, death, stepping on death, etern eternal life giving us. So um, it's like a double negation of death in order to access uh, eternal life. It's very interesting. Okay, I stop. <laughs> can I can I just shortly intervene here about jump in there, Mika? About, about who is dying and all, everything. Since uh, well, maybe I could drift off the kind of like Lacanian diagnostics of neurosis here a little bit, since uh, if we think of neurosis as comprising hysteria and obsession, uh, well the to my understanding, the Lacanian view would be that um, hysteria would be that, well, both neuroses are a way of asking a question. They are a question addressed to the other. And uh, hysteric is concerned about the gender. The hysterical question is, am I a woman or a, am I a man? Which is basically a way of asking, what does it mean to be a man if I am a hysteric? What does it mean for me to be a man in this life that I live and so on? So that's a hysteric. And I was reminded of uh, this fact since the question of the obsessional is, am I alive or am I dead? So Lacan gives this view of obsessional neurotic as a kind of a, like an actor in a play who has uh, modified his own desire made it dead and the obsessional neurotic is acting out a kind of like an empty script which she or he does not understand in any way but just acts it out and waits for the death of the master so when you are asking that 
who is dying? Are we waiting for the master to die so that we can begin to live ourselves? That's the question that I would pose to you. Are, are, are we waiting for the master, the, the oppressor to die so that we can then only begin to live ourselves? Since I think that we can easily make Lacan into this, well, he placed certain ways of making this impossible, but uh, I mean, in principle, but it is possible to take Lacan as this kind of like empty intellectual master who just gives these empty phrases for us to contemplate eternally. And then we become these obsessional neurotics who just contemplate what, what the master says, what the master says, what the master says. And then we are only okay. waiting for the master to die so that we can begin to live ourselves and fully understand what we are doing. Since the neurotic doesn't understand what she is doing, she just acts out the play and the neurotic situation mystifies everything. It, it brings it forth the kind of like eternal life that can just go on unless she really thinks about death. I mean, the fact of dying itself would bring, bring another historical trajectory into play. So that, I mean, in the type of life that I am envisaging here, there are no repetitions, strictly speaking, but only, only like one take at a time. I mean, if, if we think about our life as some, some type of like eternal play in which children, I think, conceive their life, which there are always like retakes, one can all, always repeat this the same thing and nothing ever changes and everything. I mean, Mika. the true recognition of death would, I think, end this type of like empty play. Mika, do you propose yeah. to sac do you propose to sacrifice the master? Are you sacrifice proposing the master? What do you mean? And to transform him in a saint or what? Now, I, I, now it's just a joke. Now, in a way, you 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 are asking uh, uh, if maybe we are not living under the symbol of uh, the master signifier and what do you order, mean by master and in order to liberate ourselves from the master we have to sacrifice him to kill him like in the oedip uh, complex but i think uh, uh, the best is to kill the inner master what 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 do you mean by master i mean i think that you are mystifying the situation here no 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 you were you were telling about lacan that lacan is our master signifier no, no, no. and that we oh. are talking um, in name of uh, this um, master signifier who is lacan no, with no. Uh, his school with his writings that's how i understood maybe i'm wrong you so, are wrong yeah I, I think that you're wrong and you misunderstood okay. what i said Okay, so uh, what I what I propose is just to 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 not to be loyal to Lacan, not to be loyal to Lacan in okay. order to become real Lacanians. Uh, you, you real can... Lacanians, so so that you are an obsessive who is just constantly uh, contemplating empty phrases. Phrases, is that true? Uh, can you repeat the question? So we stick to the master signifier and just. Uh, give the uh, signifying chains all the time and act out a play and wait for the master to die. Is that right? I mean, I, I don't want to dwell on this. this I, is, I, the... I see that this is going nowhere. This is going nowhere. So yes, no, no, no. I... Coyote's question. This is going nowhere. Now I'm just uh, no, no. I don't want to to make a joke here, but I'm killing him um, many times and then resurrecting him again. So I'm repeating this process all the time. You know. No, no, it was a joke. I think that uh, every singularity here present has its own chance to, to, to kill uh, the master. Now, if it's an inner or an outside one, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, hence the fact that I begin talking about obsessional neurosis here. Yeah. All right, I think getting, get maybe, maybe getting, <clears throat> To to Jayoti's question now, I, I don't know if it's. I, I merely want to make this point not to in any way resolve the tension between Mika and Alexander, but more to point towards where we are in um, Freud's writings at the moment. Is that I think it's incredibly interesting that he's increasingly making this distinction between 
something like life itself as a mortal and and the individuals which are kind of incarnate individual organismic incarnations of 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 this immortal uh germplasm he'll call it um and 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 sort of situating this tension between mortality and immortality as really at the at the core of the sexual and egoic tension in the neuroses um I'm finding that interesting to think about and 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 maybe some of Mika's points about the obsessional neurotic and the hysteric are are worth thinking about in regards to that tension. Um, but I, I also want to get to Jayadi's uh, point. Yeah, thanks, Kadil. Um, of course, very powerful uh, lectures, both of them. So I have two uh, comments over here. One thing is he's, very, he's talking about illusion and which I think is very important, which is a very necessary thing for uh, perpetuation and making something like war possible. War is not possible without creating certain kind of illusion, uh, which he's very interestingly relating with the disappointment that we largely experience and very soothing also because when then realizes that one should not expect too much from um, human race, uh, uh, the kind of uh, um, understatement that is going over here. Uh, I was, I, I'm not so sure about it. So I was wondering, so my first question is that, is this illusion then is creating an ideal ego, which is creating a delusionary world, which makes possible um, something like war uh, over here. That's my first thing. Second question is more related to the parallels that I can see between what we can see happening at the level of wars that states are doing and what is happening in any say patriarchal orthodox orthodox family setup that we can see so in a war you have a state which is um, almost loose in terms of morality but it is expecting very high morality from its population it is able to do that by this by the creation of an external enemy um, which becomes essential over here one can see even at the level of family whatever is done to women or even to um, even to make family function uh, uh, it works almost in the same manner you have to create on the basis of property or for the safety of women there are certain kind of uh, there is always a certain kind of external enemy that is constantly created because of which inside the family one uh, it's it's exactly the hypocrisy that comes out which we can see at the level of a state where st state is loose on morality but it is expecting high kind of allegiance and morality from the subjects even at the level of family one can see what a patriarch is doing what family structures are doing it's a completely different standard and one can see the infantilization that he's talking about that state is then treating treating its own population as children something which we can see in family also where um, um, women and um, uh, almost everybody is infantilized then even to maintain the structure of a family illusion becomes extremely important so families have to create this illusion of we keep our secrets to ourselves you know and we are this lovely um, at least in a context from where i come india it's a very powerful thing of um, being a close knit family and how some of the things uh, which are considered to be censored should not go out um, something which continues to bind it also and how this illusion then becomes extremely claustrophobic for people who are living inside and um, um, yeah it's it's a it's a delusionary world where this ideal ego is created which then leads to um, neurosis and disappointment later on yeah really subtle complex i'm not gonna pretend i can i'm not gonna pretend i can can, can answer the question but but more point towards like well one appreciating the reflection and and two sort of i think it brings out what was sort of on my mind during the presentation itself of this problematic status of illusion and truth like this this weird like i almost feel like freud treats the relationship between illusion and truth as too simplistic maybe too classical a distinction which i think is kind of not really present in lacan when he says for example the truth is structured like a fiction um and I think that this 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 is at play in the weird dynamics you're talking about about the family, which I also relate to very strongly. This idea that in a close knit family there are some things censored, um, but that the very censoring is what binds the family, and that if you bring out what is censored, you destroy the family. So what is the truth in this situation? You know, it, it is is the truth revealing everything? And, and, and losing all family relations? Or is the truth the illusion 
<laughs> that's keeping the family together in the first place. Is that what you're trying to point at or, or at least in some dimension? Oh, uh, well, yeah. Um, yeah, the fact that uh, a family is not ready to face the real or the reality. And if we continue to run away from the truth. And um, also, um, I just find it, I find an infinite loop over here in the sense that in our context, I can see it happens at the level of family, then you can see happening at the level of a residential complexes. So we have gated societies. So gated societies have to create enemy. Enemy is the working class people who are outside. So you yeah. continue to create. So it's a, it's a loop. The loop doesn't seem to end. And then, of course, it extends till the level of state also. Well, Eric just left an interesting point, which I'll read here. It says Zizek and McGowan talk about ideology requiring a fundamental lie that everyone must believe in. Everyone is united by this fundamental lie. And I do think that when it comes to, like I was specifically appreciating your reflection on, on the close-knit family and the claustrophobia, um, that... Uh, you know, it, on some level, like I, like for I can give the personal example that people in like I always criticize my family as being too uh, lost in an idealistic illusion that's not real, and then they criticize me with being too harsh and real. So so so, but 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 here I'm not saying I'm right and they're wrong. You know, because I because I'm also I'm also aware that. You know, it, it, it's a matter of like, I think what Freud said in this in this paper, um, you know, just being able to, to 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 endure life, you know, just being able to get by. Like, I, I am also aware that there, you know, when it comes to building a family, there are certain truths which make the family unworkable or make the family unlivable for the people sustaining the family. So, and that has a certain truth in itself, you know, and I, and I, and I do think like, you know, reflecting deeper on this uh, quote that Eric's leaving here, that when it comes to, for example, <clears throat> a man and a woman deciding to enter a long-term relationship, um, it, it, it's not the case, I, you know, very rarely the case that the man and the woman just reveal everything about themselves and 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 go on with that truth you know it's 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 often the cut time i don't know what percentage of the time if not all of the time but men and women get together and they present a certain illusion of each other and, and then they then they they go into the mess together you know so there's always you know what to to, to eric's point this this lie uh you know and, and i know that zizek zizek says this a lot in less than nothing as well he says that especially in war times, um, the truth needs to be guarded by lies, that, that lies have a certain function. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it's yeah, very Freud complicated. Also, uh, Freud is also talking about this in this essay when he's talking about hypocrite men and he's saying that how they are also at times essential uh, and necessary for civilization. Absolutely, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's so and it's it's so difficult for especially the like for like someone who's extremely literalist or rationalist or something to grapple with this uh weird relation uh, mika did you want to jump in then we'll get to alexander yeah, yeah, just, maybe i'm just riffing off the topic but it, well it, it's a good question that if we think about the fact of illusion itself does it create some kind of like impossible ideal some basis or some object that escapes the illusory illusory consciousness so the fact that freud is talking in this paper about this illusionment he's, he's the first half of the paper is concerned with the very disillusionment that is caused by the war what the fact of war brings a sort of a state of non-illusion and i was also like caught by the fact that he brings the notion of illusion there and just leave it, leave it there. He doesn't say what it means to have some type of like ideological illusion or something like that. But so when we think about Zizek's theory of uh, ideology, well, the old school Marxist theory of ideology would perhaps be characterized in terms that 
the ideological illusion is something that distorts the true reality of the social, uh, the historic uh, situation. So for the old school Marxist, there is some kind of like substantial truth about the relationship between the two actors, say the capitalist who is uh, buying the labor from the worker. And the situation has to be distorted for the capitalist to be able to expropriate uh, the surplus value and everything like that. It's a complex situation, which I have simplified, but yeah. So where, where does Zizek's theory of ideology begin? Uh, it really begins to, with the claim that this uh, view of the illusion, uh, sort of like masking the true reality of things, it creates some kind of like really real, which somehow eludes the illusory grasp of the ideological subjects. And for Zizek, we really have to jettison this whole idea that there is some kind of like really real, which the ideological mind doesn't it, it, it struggles with, it doesn't get it. And really the illusion is the whole fantasy which structures reality itself. And we, we have to reconcile with the fact that uh, reality itself begins with some type of illusion and the fundamental illusion for, I think for Zizek would be the fact of transference. The fact that we have to believe in the truth of the law. I mean, the, the fact that we have to somehow be sexually or libidinally uh, solicited by the uh, ideology to be able to function in a reality in, in the first place, it's, it's some type of like, it, it's, it's the real, I mean, the real is this illusion for Zizek. Eric, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you have something directly to say here yeah um <clears throat> at the very end of lacan's seminar 25 which some would say is you know his last seminar so the very end of of lacan um he says uh that really what psychoanalysis is, is all about is getting to this gap between the imaginary and the real he says, if we do not go straight to this distance between the imaginary and the real, we are without recourse for what is involved in distinguishing in a psychoanalysis, the gap between the imaginary and the real. It is not for nothing that I took this path. The thing, das Ding, I'm assuming here he's talking about the la chose, is what we must stick to. And the thing qua imagined, namely the fabric qua represented. The difference between the representation and the object is something capital. Um, and, and, and so it's interesting here at the, at the very end, he, he says what, what's really at stake here is this gap between the traumatic uh, thing and all of our imaginings. And, and what is really kind of in the middle of that is uh, not only the symbolic order that knits it all together, um, <clears throat> but the symptom, the symptom. And, and so, you know, seeing how it is, it is um, all of the things that I think make up civilization, culture, society, are, are things that are both uh, a symbolic, system that gives structure and these various symptomatic features of, of our of society. That is, is everything that is involved in uh, creating and maintaining some distance from that traumatic thing. And so I think in, in terms of war, where, where that traumatic thing is is more apparent in in the form of violence and death that um that the imaginary the illusion the 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 image is is not able to um is not able to to cover over that real 
And so there may be then a redoubling or a stronger effort, effort from the point of view of the symbolic or the symptom to try to create some, uh, some lie, some ideology, something to, to try to reinstantiate that distance from the, the traumatic thing. There are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so thank you, Eric. This is, uh, and Mika. So will you then go, um, I mean, what you are saying is that reality during the point of war is so brutal that one really can't confront the real and you need the masking in the sense of we, the great nation. Uh, something which is constantly created at the at the times of war, which help us reconcile with the uh, trauma of war. It it it, it does some, some certain kind of bombing, certain kind of covering, right? Eric, did you want to respond to that? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know she was talking to me. Uh, can you say <laughs> you that again? Repeat? Yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. You want me to repeat, Eric? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I, all I, I was just saying that this means that I, I understand because uh, earlier it was actually questioning. It was actually disturbing the way I was looking at things. But the way I'm understanding it, it makes sense in the sense that during the war time, the reality, the actual reality is so brutal. It's so traumatic that one requires certain kind of covering, certain kind of shield, and which can come in the form of the we, the great nation. And you need this kind of illusion, you know, um, which, which helps you sustain whatever trauma the war poses. Uh, in that sense, if we then bring, it, bring in Hannah Arendt, who says that uh, in today's times we don't have war and politics is uh, politics is the new war. Politics is actually a war. Wars are now played in the rooms where politics happen. So one can then also understand that how um, most of the nations are constantly creating this narcissistic um, larger image, illusionary image of we being the great, uh, the, the greatest of all nations. So, um, I mean, I see states constantly creating this illusionary world, um, illusionary reality for the subjects, which actually justifies most of the immoral acts that they do inside their, inside their own borders. Yeah, and we just have to go back to uh, Baudrillard's um, essay that the, um, the Gulf War did not take place. You know, the, the Gulf War took place yeah. at the level of this illusion that we created of the war that was, it was televised, it was, it was enacted in front of us in a very carefully planned out way, where, whereas, and it wasn't a true war, it wasn't a, an actual conflict between two roughly equal opposing sides, but it was a, it was a surgical um, operation that was, in a sense, al already a bait and switch. Right. And, and, and so even, and, and here's where it, it gets redoubled, where war itself is the illusion. I think this is what maybe Mika was, was saying earlier. War itself becomes the illusion, right? It's not that, it's not that we, we, we're trying to get some illusion to shield us from the war now. War okay. is now the illusion to give us some distance from the, the, the traumatic thing that is um, autocratic state violence and exploitation, or we could think of it as a, you know, imperial violence, right? And now, so now war is the very thing that we use in order, that's the lie that we believe in that creates that ideology. That's that's kind of scary. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Something that I, I was also maybe maybe with this would complicate the pictures is when we think about the 911 attacks. Uh, doesn't it represent a case where war becomes a sort of a lie after the fact? I mean, the whole traumatic impact of the image of the two towers falling, the trauma of the real in there sort of like becomes, uh, one could even say, a justification for war then. That's what happened. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. 
yeah, there was this, this kind of, um, this thought, I think in the, the, the id of, of the American or the Imperial hive mind is that we need a war. War is what drives, and here's the, the real, the, the spectral real that Zizek talks about. War drives the American economy. We are a war-based economy. We've been so since World War II. And so we, we are constantly looking for war in order to drive the, the, the machines of our economy. And so when an opportunity presents itself, then, then we welcome it. We lean into it. We create those conditions for it to, to appear, right? So, and this is, again, I think what I'm talking about in terms of a sublation, the, um, the, the, the violence gets sublated to, to this spectral level of, well, really it's, it's what drives the American economy, you know? <laughs> and that's, that is, uh, that's the real, not the war itself. The war itself is the imaginary that allows us to not think about the fact that it is actually war that drives our economy. Could it also be a kind of a real of capitalism? I mean, well, yeah, ultimately, yeah. This is, we, we can return to reading Marx's uh, uh, account of the original uh, like appropriation in capitalism and it really brings into mind some kind of war type situation and everything. But then again, we can think of the whole uh, industrial military complex in United States as this type of like capitalist organization even, which creates wars so as to sustain itself. Mm. Some, something like that, maybe. I mean, when I, you know, when I was reflecting on this paper and specifically Freud was talking about how nations rationalize their intent really just to act out their most base passions you know and then i was reflecting on when i was studying the response of the american politicians to 9 11 i mean the the speech the discourse in those rooms on september 12th and september 13th was just mad passion it was like you know it was like kids on the playground like kids on the playground is like, hey, that guy hit me in the dick. Like, yeah, well, we're going to all round up all of our, well, we have way more weapons than that guy. We're going to go and fuck, we're going to go lynch him after school. You know, like it's, it, it's exactly what it was. And, and, and then they just stumbled into Afghanistan and Iraq like idiots and just made a, an enormous mess of everything. It was really the, the most irrational the most irrational possible behavior. Yeah, splendid. Yeah. Like, hey, that guy hit me in the dick. Oh, we're going to go, we're going to go destroy all their dicks then. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the, the, I think that one of the weird things, I mean, of course, we're coming close to the end, but like one of the interesting things, maybe to, to bring it back in, the conversation back in is, is how even though we haven't endured something on the level of a World War I or a World War II in terms of that type of war, you know, I mean, you can definitely say a war like the war in Afghanistan or the war in Iraq are, are just as devastating of wars and, and, and how, how far, I mean, it's, there's not really a notion of teleological progress here. It's, it's that, it's that, we're developing more and more advanced technologies and the capacity for these, what Freud calls ineradicable primal motives are, are just, as, just as close to the weapons of, of mass destruction and the weapons of power as they've ever been. So it, it, it really creates the conditions of possibility for, I mean, you know, it, it's almost like, it's almost like a hopeless situation in, in, I don't know that that's that's what that's that's the feeling I have it's not I, I don't want to say it's totally hopeless but just that the, the the conditions of possibility for this level of destruction is is seemingly always there and will never go away I mean I don't know if it I mean the the, the big the big difference it seems to me is 
the capacity of nations to recruit us as individuals. That seems to be different. Um, and, and, that, and, that it's, and that war has become mass automatized where like you have Obama sending drone strikes, for example, like so that that's that's quite different. But, you know, I don't know where it's going. Alexandra, did you have a yes, some final uh, words of wisdom for us here? Now, I, I just want to give an example. Um, the example of uh, the manifesto, the manifesto of the 93 professors scientists and artists, uh, the well-known uh, professors of Germany, the well-known scientists of Germany, 93, who signed that manifesto and um, uh, they put all their scientific power in name of uh, patriotism, of German patriotism to sustain the first world war. So it's a very good example in which we see how this uh, so-called objective science becomes very subjective and uh, how people lose their objectivity in front of uh, drives of desire of uh, constructing an ideal, this uh, national ideal. And uh, at the end, uh, they had to to explain to, to after after they lost uh, the war they had to to come with some uh, arguments why they were so unconscious and they put all this science in name of uh, in the name of uh, of so called uh, national ideal so um, and uh, eric uh, brought this example of this uh, pandemic in which uh, it's uh, it's something very similar to what happened then. So it's so easy to lose, uh, to lose uh, the objectivity of your discourse and to become totally irrational. So what I want to say again is that uh, indeed the Jayati, there is a very thin layer, a very thin layer, uh, so-called hypocrisy, as you said, of so-called civilized and moral world. And under this, uh, there is the wild man, the savage. And um, my question to you is, what do you think, because you brought this problem of a patriarchal family, what do you think uh, uh, it's a structure? It's Jayodi, a stru Jayodi emphasized that. Yes, yes. Yeah. And Jayodi, uh, you, you, you asked, what do you think uh, in this, um, in this uh, patriarchal family, um, who is sacrificed? Is somebody sacrificed in name of uh, the master, in name of uh, the powerful patriarch who is sacrificed? And that's my last word. I can't, um, I cannot, uh, I have to think about uh, again about uh, this idea of uh, the scapegoat of sacrificing somebody. We need to transform somebody in a scapegoat in order to to find a cohesion of the group, the cohesion of happy family, or the cohesion of happy nation, or the cohesion of uh, uh, scientific uh, saving world. And what about the what about the cohesion of a happy return to Freud? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have to kick anyone out yet? Yeah. <laughs> I agree totally. Who are we going to kick out, guys? <laughs> no. <laughs> Jayati? I can be sacrificed, no problem. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, Alexandra. So, um, I don't have a grip on uh, Lacan, so I will be avoiding the term master signifier and master over there. But, of course, at the face of it, um, of course, in a family, one can say that children and women largely, but, of course, patriarchy works against everyone. It works against men also in ways that they, real they don't realize. One can say the similar structure at the level of state also. It's a very stupid state that is extremely brutal towards its own subjects in the name of... Uh, in the name of creating an external enemy. And time has shown that great civilizations have, have gone down also because of that, which I think our nation states need to realize today. 
So again, I see a parallel. I think it goes against both. It appears to, at the level of state, it appears that subjects are getting sacrificed, but I think the state also, it does weaken the state. You know, like Foucault would say that it's a, it's a stupid prince, you know, who doesn't realize, um, who doesn't realize the, the, the limits of um, governing. Uh, when does it become too much? This is something that uh, we all need to be aware of. In families, it becomes very clear. Mm, yeah. Okay. Unless there's anyone who wants to give a, a final final thought, um, I'm just I'm just gonna wrap up. We haven't heard from Chitan. He's here, presumably. We miss you, Chitan. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> I'm just listening to the actually. I was playing in the. <laughs> we, we we love you and we miss you. Yeah, I miss you all too. <laughs> all right. All right. So um, I'm just going to wrap up. Um, so yeah, we... Oh, yeah. Yeah, Mika? Just go for it, man. Yep, go for it. So yeah, we covered a paper. Thoughts. Oh, thoughts. What's the official title? Thoughts for the Times on War and Death from 1915. I'll just re-emphasize for <clears throat> the viewers that I think this paper is a is a is a crucial turning point in in Freud's writings, uh, as I think Mika emphasized. Uh, stimulated from this backdrop of World War One, he starts to reflect a lot more on society, civilization. What is the meaning of psychoanalysis for, or what can psychoanalysis say about? things outside of the clinic and outside of our own individual psyches. Um, and specifically, of course, highlighting death. And death becomes a lot more prominent in his thinking um, and writing. And we will be covering that definitely in the paper spanning perhaps the next decade or so. Um, death becomes much more uh, central and in uh, and some sense, uh, complementary to what has been developed so far in, in libido theory. So thank you guys for your, your time, attention, contribution. I think this discussion was, was particularly enlightening. So I thank you all. And I'll hopefully see you all in the next Return to Freud. Thank you. Thanks, Kadel. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye. Peace and love. <laughs>